Hi, Demi. How are you? Hi, Anima. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for uh, taking the time to do this. Yeah, thanks for doing this. A uh, lot of activities that you're doing uh, is amazing. It's helping the community so much. You know, bringing yeah. more attention to, you know, how to plan and how to uh, give books, how to write the pay scale. So, and the this. <laughs> So yeah, the yeah. like human side of it is so important and uh, yeah, exactly. so much culture kind of tries to right, put that to the underground. So. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Um, and so I have a whole list of questions that I've prepared. Um, some of them might need, like might take some thought. And so if you want to feel free to pause and think about it. Um, if you want to skip a question, let me know. Um, I'll make sure we end on time and so you don't need to feel pressure to like answer quickly or answer briefly. Um, yeah, we can skip questions. We don't have to make sure we get through all of it. Um, and so in general, if you can err on the side of sharing, being open, transparent, authentic to the extent that you're comfortable, um, that would be great. Sounds good. I mean, do you want the dummy to take off the virtual background? Sometimes <laughs> it's a bit distracting with uh, all the you know, kind of yeah. when I'm all it's, over the place. Yeah, it's up to you. It's up to you. Whatever, yeah, whatever yeah, works for you. I, 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 either way is fine, but yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. this, yeah, yeah. good. Um, all right. So my first question is, what were you doing just before this call? Um, I was just, uh, I finished my lunch. It's lunch time here in California, and uh, editing a paper. There's a new Rips workshop due today, so uh, some few Slack messages. Uh, so as you can see, there's a lot of multitasking, right? Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. finally putting on a dress. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, we're working from home. Uh, I tend to be a lot more relaxed, and some aspects of that is great. Yeah, yeah. How about you? Um, I, yeah, I was just getting ready to, um, yeah, putting on my headphones, making sure the recording works and things of that sort. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, what is your daily routine like? It, you know, it widely varies. And as I was saying, now with the pandemic, it's the new normal, right? Like before this, uh, as I'm sure you were in the same process as well of, right, doing research, like talking to various different collaborators, then traveling, <laughs> giving talks, attending conferences, panels. Uh, and so just it was such a busy, crazy life looking back. I mean, I guess I didn't even have a chance to kind of take pause and say, oh, look, these are all the set of activities I've been involved in. I mean, it was energizing. I also enjoyed meeting people and brainstorming. So some of that I miss in the uh, pandemic, but on the other hand, uh, I have a lot more time to, you know, do yoga, dance, yeah. <laughs> just, right? Like kind of, there was so much time spent uh, traveling. I mean, even if it's local travel, going from one meeting to another. So it's more seamless. If only we could like also have that, all the nonverbal interaction and like recreate some of that in-person yeah. I think in other ways, this is much better. Yeah, 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 for sure. They're giving an invited talk. It's so much, it's a much smaller commitment now rather than having to like fly coast to coast or spend two, two and a half days um, for like an hour talk. So, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And, and I hope this way, especially more uh, women can uh, do this, right? I personally don't have kids, but my friends who do, they would turn down a lot of those opportunities because they just couldn't go and now hopefully there is more openness to this even after we overcome exactly. this. Exactly. Yeah. And I think we'll probably go into a hybrid mode, right? That there will be some events that are in person. I do miss that. I want some aspects of that. Yeah. But in a more balanced way, I mean, it shouldn't be on a daily basis that, uh, right? You yeah. are expected to go to different places. Yeah. And, and yeah. So yeah. Makes sense, makes sense. Um, what tends to be the favorite part of your day? Um, I mean, at the moment, it's been like, for me, like doing yoga, I never had a chance to get into it, even though, you know, I grew up in India. It's supposed to be part of my culture. <laughs> I was just kind of not, uh, you know, I was dancing, I was doing Bharat Natyam, I guess you could say some aspects of yoga are also in it. I see the 
common threads there. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me now, getting back to a point where, you know, I can focus my mind, right? Like we don't have to be in this mad rush to always keep running, always be more productive, always more and more and more. <laughs> and, uh, and even I feel like when I was earlier playing sports, it was more competitive. I always wanted to win something. Yeah. Whereas yoga to me is not about winning anything, right? <laughs> like I'm not pushing my body beyond a limit. I mean, I also do cardio, you know, in a mix sometimes. But if I'm just doing yoga, there's no question of pushing for something. It's just listening in words to your body and mind. Yeah. And then once I'm in that state, I feel I'm so much more productive. You know, I can be more creative when I'm then getting into thinking about research topics from doing that. Uh, it's such a great feeling. So these days I'm uh, kind of honing that more. Yeah, yeah, that sounds nice. That sounds nice. Um, what tends to be the least favorite part of your day? Oh, well, I think right now it is not having a lot of in-person interaction, right? Like for someone, somebody who is even like maybe just a few miles away, right? So I have to still do this uh, on Zoom or uh, the video conferencing tools. And, and they're still not great for uh, discussing math. I think mm -hmm. high level ideas, somehow we can kind of do this, uh, but for being able to write equations online mm -hmm. and, and then debate, I mean, kind of having that feel of that full whiteboard <laughs> and you know, it feels more like, okay, there is boundless now space to write and debate right that's missing and uh yeah so the least favorite part is missing out on in-person interactions yeah yeah um what is one chore you dislike the most and why um i mean when it comes to more on the professional side i would say you know the administrative one over time i've come to appreciate it's needed right i mean without it things will fall apart you also want that uh and thankfully, you know, in the organizations I'm at, both Caltech and NVIDIA, uh, there is very little of it, uh, but still it is my least favorite. <laughs> if only we could automate so much of it, I mean, we shouldn't get rid of it because the system has to be there, there has to be accountability, there has to be these processes. Mm -hmm. But if you could make that more seamless and more, in a modern age, right? when we go back to that, it's like, okay, you know, we're talking about AI and then you know, yeah. whether it's filing an expense report or any of that. And thankfully I have a great admin who helps me with that, but still for her to kind of have to spend her time doing it, she could yeah. be doing so many other things. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I think, and that's what tells us broadly in society, there is still so many other opportunities to have better automation, uh, more productivity for people, and more free time to do useful things in their lives, right? And yeah. not, uh, just on social media platform. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you struggle with procrastination? So um, I would say when I was younger, I was more prone to that. Mostly because I think I'm, you know, now that I think about it, I'm driven a lot by adrenaline. Mm. So I found it kind of very boring to be always on time <laughs> for something or <laughs> right, follow every rule. So it felt like there was more of then if I was rushing at things, then it was a challenge. Like I was challenged. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> kind of do it in a shorter amount of time, right? So. Mm. I would say, I mean, subconsciously, I think that's what was happening when I was procrastinating. Hmm. Uh, but these days, thankfully, I have, you know, so many collaborative projects and I have like lots of back-to-back -back meetings and, uh, and I have, you know, great team that uh, make sure I don't procrastinate <laughs> because <laughs> they are proactive. They are always reaching out to me and uh, I make sure that's why I'm surrounded by people who are also responsible and driven right in their own way to mm -hmm. accomplish what they're you know the projects they're involved in yeah and i think uh, having a more team-based effort will help uh, researchers not to get into that and that's why i almost all you know uniformly all my projects are all highly collaborative right mm -hmm. and it involves researchers at different levels um, you know the beginning grad student is not uh, 
left uh, on their own, they have like, you know, maybe a senior grad student, a postdoc could be even, uh, you know, a researcher or another faculty. So there are so many like kind of levels of help they, they can get. Mm -hmm. And what I also encourage is students to receive that, right? Not everybody is brought up with that. And, uh, uh, you know, either some people are shy or especially I see more with men, they, they feel like their ego, you know, they're taught not to ask for that. So, so there's all these, right, like kind of issues to overcome, but I, I ensure that right? They're always asking for help. They give me regular updates. Mm -hmm. So it isn't a mad rush to the deadline. You know, yeah. we, we read papers much early on as a group. We mm -hmm. give uh, comments and it's a very broad group. Uh, and I'm sure, you, I, I think you also do the same. I remember you <laughs> mentioned that. You know, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, blogs or, you know, writings. So, mm -hmm. so all this, I think, helps, you know, we want to have a system around so that an individual doesn't feel they're on their own and then they procrastinate later on, they feel bad about it, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's not a healthy cycle. To exactly, me. yeah, it's a bit of a vicious cycle. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, do you struggle with time management? Um, yeah, I mean, I think now <laughs> the pandemic has thankfully opened my eyes in that sense. <laughs> Earlier it was... Uh, I don't even know how, right? I mean, thankful. Uh, my admin again is great. Like over time, I've told her what's important, what's not. And so she's been great at managing that. Uh, uh, for me, it's always this excitement of, okay, there is there are more people to meet. <laughs> right? There is more to learn. Uh, and uh, how to say no uh, yeah. was much harder. Uh, and now I have, I try to develop that more because there is, uh, you know, there's a lot of requests I get, uh, as I'm sure you're also on the same boat. And I want to ask myself how, you know, how many people am I helping through this, mm -hmm. right? So it does matter, like, how much is the reach of the platform? Uh, and it also matters to me how much I learn from that experience, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's uh, shouldn't be that uh, I'm only feel like I'm giving if I'm not <laughs> and learning in that process and that's why I enjoy events that are collaborative right that have panels especially from different areas I tend to attend conferences that are not just in core machine learning but mm -hmm. broader uh, so those are the ones I enjoy the most yeah yeah makes sense um, do you set an alarm in the morning uh, these days, I think because I've been, you know, sleeping well and more regularly, I do have one, but I tend to wake up before that just on mm. time. So it's been a good regular sleep cycle. But yeah, before that, it was just, I wasn't constant jet lag, like, you know, <laughs> for years, maybe decades, like, uh, it just felt like I never kind of had like this, uh, right, ability to kind of get into my own rhythm. Mm -hmm. And so I was always looking at external forces to <laughs> keep in <inside> me <laughs> wherever it did. And uh, yeah, honestly, looking back, I think that was not healthy to uh, be, uh, you know, either jet lagged or putting all nighters, right? Like whatever any people do, I think uh, there is a lot in our culture, whether it's academic culture or right, like the outside culture, everything just encourages us to not prioritize sleep. And uh, now that I do it, it's just so much better in, uh, in every way. I can focus better. <laughs> I can uh, be much more effective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if I were to ask your friends, what is Anima like? What do you think would be three adjectives they might use? Ah, oh, that is, that is, uh, well, again, I can only project, right? This is okay. what I hope they will say. <laughs> <laughs> really depends on who you ask. Uh, uh, I would say maybe hopefully the first one uh, would be helpful. Uh, then maybe brave. <laughs> uh, and uh, maybe passionate. I guess brave and passionate are related. But uh, uh, but yeah, that's yeah. again that's my guess. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, are there any aspects of you that you think your friends might be missing? 
um, I think it's, uh, yeah, that's again. <laughs> yeah, it's good you're asking these questions. These are always uh, things typically we don't think about. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, in general, uh, I have a hard time uh, opening up my emotions, right? Or even having that vocabulary to express the feelings and the range of it. Uh, um, mostly because, right, we've been in this highly masculine culture of, uh, you know, STEM and tech. And like, I feel like ever since I, you know, was 18, I was in a classroom full of guys, you know, if, most of the time I was the only woman, right? So kind of consciously and subconsciously, you know, developing that uh, tough exterior uh, means that uh, it takes me much longer uh, to trust somebody to be vulnerable and uh, to, <laughs> to truly share that because there is, I think, uh, a lot of that um, more in the external and professional world that I feel like we have to keep fighting against. And, and in a way, it's good now there is more awareness, you know, including, uh, you know, we all are uh, trying to improve this culture and make it much more uh, uh, welcoming and uh, healthier and the I thank you for doing this series uh, as part of that. Um, and so hopefully, and I, that's why I've also been having this emotional growth to not always have such a tough barrier and be more seamless and surround myself with people whom I can trust so I don't have to be in those toxic environments. And that's also part of saying no. Like if I look at the panel, there's no other room and I'm like, forget this. You know, especially the guys, I don't have a good feeling. I'm like, why do this, right? So, I mean, I, in, indeed I'm in a position of privilege to be able to say that, uh, but I feel like more people should take such a stance. That way you can filter out <laughs> good events and good things in life where you can be more yourself yeah yeah makes sense makes sense um are you happy with the number of close friends you have so i would say over time uh it's been more about quality than quantity right <laughs> so uh certainly like compared to in college and although Right. I mean, I, I care about them. We are connected, right? People are all over the world and uh, uh, they have their own lives uh, going on with so many uh, responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So I would say in that sense, yeah, people I'm in regular touch uh, uh, is much lower. But on the other hand, I have that support network, right? Friends and even family, especially my mother is such a great source of emotional support and more like a friend and you know we've also grown uh through this relationship in terms of like she you know trusting me and respecting me to <laughs> make choices uh but also being trying to be a friend giving like advice without expecting it would be always executed mm -hmm. uh, so yeah so i value the close friends and family i have yeah yeah um, what is something you're worse at than people around you? Um, yeah, I think uh, that goes back to the earlier point of expressing uh, feelings and communicating uh, uh, because uh, so much of it I felt, uh, you know, that there was no reason to talk about it, right? <laughs> and uh, also, like, I, uh, you know, feeling that it was... Uh, I could focus more on math. I could focus more on <laughs> my professional accomplishments. Uh, but now trying to have a more wholesome picture, I would say, you know, I've been developing tools to also have that communication better. Yeah, yeah. Um, what is your single biggest strength? I would say perseverance. Uh, I tend <laughs> not to give up on things. <laughs> maybe another term uh, my friends may use, maybe stubborn, or at least <laughs> I know my uh, family would use that uh, because growing up I had that stubbornness. And now, right, like how to turn that perseverance into things that matter, like diversity and inclusion uh, in the community, preventing harassment. So those are things that, uh, you know, I... Hope I'll keep fighting forever. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, what is a recurring moral conflict that you struggle with? I think this, um, you know, growth as a researcher versus a team leader, right? There is uh, a lot of uh, excitement and fulfillment I receive when I'm solving a problem myself, right? Digging deeper, especially into maybe new areas of math, deriving equations, you know, like uh, I was doing theory before, I still do to some extent with my students. Uh, but I think balancing doing that on my own versus <laughs> letting others do it and do it well, right? I think this is something we all grapple. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, that's a delicate balance to be made. But what I tell myself is life is this long marathon, right? So I want to make sure there's enough time for me to think on my own, but also ensure that everybody is supported, right? Yeah. It should come at an expense that, right, the team is not taken care of. Yeah, so yeah. A balance. Makes sense, makes sense. Um, is there a specific instance where you distinctly recall feeling privileged? Um, I think I've uh, only been aware of both my privilege and lack of privilege only recently, right? Like ever since there's been a lot of social change here, you know, with the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter, I think that has come to the surface much more. Um, you know, for instance, uh, as a light-skinned Indian woman growing up, uh, I realized how much of a privilege it was. And in a way I was really blind to the struggles of my darker skinned friends. Uh, you know, I kind of now, it came as a flashback that uh, when I was maybe just 10 years old, uh, uh, one of my teachers told my darker skinned friend not to wear like dark colored clothes. And, that, and then she pointed at me and said, look, only girls like her can wear oh, wow. it. Yeah. And, and, you know, looking back now, I'm like, oh, my God, that was so bad for my friend. And, you know, and I feel so guilty. I didn't even check up on her after that because it didn't hit me that that would have hurt her. Right. So because back then, comments like that were seen more as like, oh, look, I'm helping you or this is a fact. Yeah. Right? So that was not um, a good environment to be in. Uh, so certainly there has been privilege, you know, based on right based on how I look based on the family I come from their engineers and educators and there is that uh, right like kind of access to math I got in very early age hmm. uh, so I don't know if I didn't have that where would I be honestly I don't know right so yeah. I'm grateful for that but at the same time right issues especially around colorism in India there is now awareness, but it has to grow more and we need to change that from the ground up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what are you insecure about? I think, um, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, that's again a tricky question. So I would say, uh, uh, you know, whether, uh, people will be able to connect and understand what I'm saying, right, in the way I feel. Like if I'm very passionate about something, right, I worry that is that message getting across and how do I get that better? Uh, I'm especially insecure now, in a way now because I've been more vocal. You know, are there others who now maybe, you know, they don't want to explicitly say something, but maybe right? Implicitly, there are ways that could be hurtful for me that because they are not happy with the message. Hmm. Uh, I'm saying more openly uh, about the problems in the community. Uh, so yeah, that does give me a bit of insecurity. But I, I tell myself in the long run, this is the right thing to do. And I also have so many allies and so many supporters and friends. So I should bank on that <laughs> rather than worry about what this other person is thinking. I mean, you know, are they uh, having good intent? Are they always uh, right able to kind of see the good in what I'm doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is something I I keep working on. Yeah, thank you, thank you for sharing that, and thank you for doing what you do. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, what you've been doing is amazing too. Like having uh, uh, these kind of 
more deeper questions outside of a therapy session. <laughs> I think it's important for the community to, you know, look at this and ask themselves these questions, right? And uh, in a way, the culture is if you're a professional, you have to <laughs> kind of have the stuff exterior, right? A leader, we are equating leadership with narcissism and somebody who's so immensely confident that they will never ever stumble and they're always right. I think that's not the definition of leader we should be using. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm really confident these uh, activities will go a long way in changing that mindset. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, have you felt or do you feel like an imposter? So I think growing up, um, so I was, I think this goes back to the, what I was saying earlier in terms of, right, like focusing more on math, focusing on doing well, right? It's because of that hyper focus, I also didn't have much of a social awareness of what people are thinking and doing around me. Hmm. So in a way that <laughs> probably worked in my favor <laughs> because right, I really didn't give a damn what people thought. <laughs> yeah. oh. I'm sure sometimes it hurt me, but most of the time, right? Like uh, in a way I didn't face that, but that doesn't mean other women don't, right? Like I talk to so many other women and uh, when they tell me how they feel that they don't belong. I connect to that. And I felt that more recently in especially, right, like these corporate conferences or events that's so, not just right in numbers being all male, but just the culture of Silicon Valley of move fast, break things, kind of like there's not even civility <laughs> and just this arrogance and like almost very explicit misogyny and sexism. I think that's like, in a way, right, try to break that the confidence I had. And that's when I realized, oh, this is really happening. This is, mm -hmm. and it's not me. It's the <laughs> environment around that is so broken. And, and maybe until now I could kind of make it because I was so blind to it. Yeah. Right? Now yeah. once I'm opening up my eyes and looking at how others are behaving, <laughs> looking at how they're reacting. I mean, not all of that is good. Of course, there is a good fraction of people who are amazing, but this maybe the minority who are toxic are really ruining it for everyone, both women and men. Uh, so we need to, so I would say the imposter syndrome is more a function of the toxicity in these environments that needs mm. to be fixed rather than something that women need to work on. Of course, women need to be aware of it and they need to fight it because the system, if it's not going to change, they are the ones who are going to suffer, right? But we focus too much on telling women and minorities how to lean in. And I'm like, you know, like, we should just smash this whole wall <laughs> of patriarchy, like not just lean in, right? Because that's where I, I feel the imposter syndrome is coming because the system is not enabling women and minorities to be who they are and to be their confident selves. And, um, you know, that's, I think part of the growth has to come from changing those cultures. Um, so I hope that's happening now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what is something you're trying out these days and how is that going? I know you mentioned yoga. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you're trying. Uh, I'm trying to think slow <laughs> and do things slower because all this time over time it was more about better and better right more optimization do things faster <laughs> do more things do uh, you know do them more so now it's like how do I do less how do I do it slower but how do I do it in a more mindful way uh, and this is what I'm encouraging my team as well, right? You don't have to write a lot of papers. It's great if you're writing also a good number of them, but think deeper about what goes into a paper. In fact, uh, you know, in one of the uh, New Rips acceptances, the paper is already accepted, but we are going to add almost an entire new set of results, right? Because, you know, there is a huge, again, now, 
uh, right uh, set of things needed for a new paper to be made and we feel like this is really in line with the current paper mm. so rather than multiply papers <laughs> <laughs> to make one impactful paper yeah right? so yeah. i think uh, that's something for the community to also think at this stage you know the last few years was this mad rush and sure deep learning was breaking through and exciting times but now as things mature what will matter is the ability to take a problem all the way to a really good endpoint where you know you can showcase the results have the code ready have others be able to adopt have it be reproducible mm -hmm. all that is so important rather than quickly writing a paper yeah yeah So yeah, so it's about doing less, thinking slow, being more mindful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Um, what is a favorite tool or trick or hack that you use um, to make life more fun or convenient or efficient that you think might be good to share? I think for me, it's change, right? It's always this kind of constant new learning and new things. So, and the way I, I do that now is by doing air for science and having more interdisciplinary collaborators. So mm -hmm. there's so much wealth of knowledge in these new areas. So nothing feels jaded. <laughs> and it's so exciting now, the possibilities of how AI can make an impact there. So I think the constant learning is something that uh, I can't imagine a life without that. And so when I feel like one area is saturated, I always tend to also broaden. I mean, not abandon that area, but see how those tools could be used in new ways and also draw inspiration from new areas back into AI, right? So it's, uh, then you're kind of having a broader uh, perspective. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's what I hope to continue doing. Yeah. Um, what do you tend to think about when you're not intentionally trying to think about something? Yeah, I think now, now, you know, my mind was always so active, like there's always, right, like, and, it, and it's such a beautiful thing if you think about your mind and how far AI is from that. <laughs> Because, you know, there have been cases where I've had like ideas of proof come in my dreams, you know, or in the shower, right? So I used to be in this constant thinking mode, even if sometimes it's subconscious of the problems I'm working on. And these days it's, again, trying to maybe sometimes disconnect from this, right? And having, again, the yoga and meditation and saying, no, don't do it. <laughs> right? You don't need to always have this super hyperactive mind. Yeah. And just kind of try to have nothingness. Yeah. And that's so hard. Like I never could meditate as a kid, you know, I was always just too, <laughs> too much like bouncing around. <laughs> and uh, even as an adult, it's hard for me. I really honestly cannot meditate more than say a few minutes. Like some people I've heard do for hours, I cannot. <laughs> But at least I'm trying now this new experiment of not thinking. <laughs> and that's hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... What is something surprising about you that the rest of us might not guess? I think it, it really depends on the context, right? Like, you know, if they see me as a woman, especially dressed up, then, you know, people are making assumptions. They may not think I'm a scientist or a professor. Uh, so, I, you know, we all have our like implicit biases in terms of uh, how we picture somebody doing something to look like and behave mm -hmm. like. Uh, so I always end up in these situations where people are surprised if they don't know me, right? Like uh, uh, what I do. And uh, um, yeah, so I would say that's, that's at one level, that's a kind of surprise. Uh, and I honestly wish it weren't the case if there were only more women, you know, more people of color, uh, more black women, I think we would have a very different uh, kind of expectation of what a scientist looks like, what a professor looks like, what a computer scientist and engineer looks like. Yeah. Uh, so that's something I constantly change, try to change people's minds. And so that's why, you know, I dress the way I like, right? I, again, I'm not thinking how I may be perceived uh, because there is so much of, I think, uh, 
thought process that goes into when other women try to dress up, they're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't wear a dress or I shouldn't wear lipstick. I mean, either way is like really should be based on your personal choice, mm -hmm. right? Like rather okay. than worrying, what is the perception created by that? Yeah. Yeah. So I try to challenge those ideas, you know, and, you know, I posted a video of me belly dancing, although I don't like the term, you know, Middle Eastern <laughs> dancing. That's uh, early in the pandemic, mostly because I know almost every one of us, we were right in not a great state because we were grappling with the uncertainty and how to be indoors and isolated, but still have a good um, emotional and mental state. Mm -hmm. And so for me doing that helped a lot. So I posted the video and that's also something uh, very shocking for many people that how can a professor you know, <laughs> post a video of belly dancing, right? And I'm like, why not? I mean, why should they be exclusive? Uh, we should all be free to pursue our hobbies. We should all be free to express ourselves in the way that we most are comfortable with. And we think this is how we, are internally so why have that like conflict between the external and internal selves yeah yeah so yeah. So, yeah, so I, if you were to pick one maybe the fact that i belly dance <laughs> would be a surprise <laughs> yeah um what is something about the world that surprises you well honestly looking at the current uh, political and social issues uh, what surprises me is the lack of critical thinking, right? Like how quickly people are drawn to emotional speeches and words. And maybe this is because I, you know, I relate to it differently. I have this uh, inability to process emotions of other people so readily, like it's something more kind of I've developed over time. So in a way, I it kind of, right, <laughs> feels so like, okay, well, what is this guy saying that's so amazing to these people that they won't like stop to ask any facts, like they won't even check. I mean, like this can go on the internet, but again, on the internet, right, if they're only looking at polarized sources that are not truthful, yeah. they're so caught up in that. I think this cognitive bias uh, the stereotyping, the implicit bias and explicit bias, like how people form opinions and don't learn and update them. That to me is so surprising. I really hope we can find a way to make everyone <laughs> always question and think, right? So, of course, you know, day-to-day -day life would be just uh, not possible unless you have some beliefs. Mm -hmm. But to have enough of an open mind to update it. Yeah. Yeah. New knowledge, because, you know, I also listen to the other side, right? Like I listen to uh, some sources that are bad, that are really disturbing to read, but I do that to try to understand, okay, how are they trying to make this argument? And why is this so compelling to a group of people? Uh, so I think we need to, and I'm reading more into psychology, like in literatures in psychology on how beliefs are formed and how uh, right, people process them. I think there's more uh, for us to think about this as we grapple with such global issues uh, in terms of misinformation and uh, polarization. Yeah, yeah. Um, what is one way in which you, you wish your life was different? Oh, when uh, I'm, uh, you know, having these professional battles, right? Uh, some, you know, I never wish I want to be a man. That would be <laughs> terrible. But I wish I was given the same privileges, the same, right, like kind of uh, opportunities and uh, the same kind of first impressions that uh, I know mm. many of the men make. And they've, you know, I've, many times I've stood right beside me, especially earlier in my career, right? And they've gone on making their pitches and that having been received uh, and all the attention being there. Uh, and so me not even kind of getting that chance to have my word in, I've uh, been in those situations. So seeing the debate yesterday between Kamala Harris and uh, our uh, VP, I, I could connect a lot to that, that it's so hard for us to even get a foot inside the door, be given that opportunity, because a lot of this is based on potential, 
right? I mean, if you've already achieved everything, you know, you must be like 60 or 70 years old, right? I mean, that's a different <laughs> stage of life. Uh, so much, right, in early stages of career is about somebody believing in you. And thankfully, I've had amazing mentors and people who've given me those opportunities. But there's so many more who haven't, right? And people don't see that in the public eye. They don't see all the negative feedback I've received and all the opportunities I haven't gotten, the rejections I've gotten. There's so much more <laughs> than the ones I have uh, where I've been accepted. Uh, so I, I really wish that uh, there was less of that um, because then I could be more open and more kind of confident rather than worrying, oh, will this be another rejection? Yeah, yeah. Um, do you think you're above average, below average, or average happy relative to people around you? Oh, that is a good question. Uh, <laughs> again, this is something that's, I, I don't know if studies have been done on this. I, I'll be curious to hear from you because I, I feel like maybe I, I can't accurately predict it, right? Mm -hmm. Because, uh, I mean, it also depends on the mindset, right? I would say when, say a few years ago, when I was trying to kind of decide what my research would be and much more uncertainty, I was certainly below average happy compared to others. Uh, but now I'm in a good state, so I would say average. Um, yeah. But sometimes it's really hard to say, even with close friends and other uh, colleagues, because there's so much of like what people hide, mm -hmm. right? They don't let their true emotions uh, be available to others. So, so that's a hard question to answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what is something you're looking forward to in the short term, like in the next few days or next week or so? Oh, this week has been the NVIDIA GTC conference. So mm -hmm. lots of exciting announcements. So we are still in the middle of the talks and the announcements on Twitter have been very busy, <laughs> you know, making sure it gets the uh, attention it deserves and getting the team excited about uh, everything we've been doing and the impact it is having on the world. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's what's keeping me busy these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I followed some of those announcements and yeah, there's a lot of exciting things happening there. Um, in particular, I, the, um, there was a session with artists and AI and um, that I thought was, uh, was especially neat. So, yeah, yes. it's great. Indeed. Indeed, right. And that's where I think AI as a tool to help us unleash our creativity better is a great approach rather than saying, AI will completely replace you. <laughs> you know, that's kind of, because art is really about expressing how you feel and connecting with others, yep. right? So that's something so innately human. Uh, so I'm really glad that NVIDIA is enabling this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when was the last time you danced? Uh, Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> so not too long ago, usually weekends are where I tend to do like an extended workout, uh, like more like the hit, you know, the high intensity mm -hmm. training uh, and then dance and then like <laughs> uh, to yoga later in the day to kind of cool it down. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, and that's where I feel grateful now I have the time to uh, yeah. be able to do that well. Yeah, yeah. Um, what was your most recent dream that you remember? That's interesting. Yeah, it was a really strange dream. So, you know, <laughs> you never get into dreams. I find that so fascinating. But I also get these highly philosophical, yet very strange dreams. Oh. Uh, and so in this case, this was, uh, you know, like somebody that I knew a while ago. And uh, it was like kind of, right, like he was trying to be cheerful and everything, but he was wearing like a face shield, like the one that he made. <laughs> <laughs> because of the virus so it's kind of like the message I interpret is like how people are wearing masks you know to shield their real emotions and how they feel wow <laughs> so I felt like okay this is strange but maybe there is a deeper message for uh something like this so uh, huh? I think dreams that way are uh, so interesting because they're just so multi-layered because they're kind of right connecting the emotions you have with maybe the 
representations of the world, how the world should look like. It can create entirely new scenes, so, you know, dream in color, have the sound <laughs> everything, and have like kind of like effects of you moving through space. Uh, it's just amazing how brain can simulate all this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Much better than any movie I've seen. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So one day if AI can do those simulations, then I think uh, we'll be in a place where it could maybe learn from that as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you more optimistic or more pessimistic than people around you? I would say that inherently I've been more pessimistic. I think that has helped me sometimes in my career because I've always been like, oh no, this is not good enough or this is not right enough and especially for sending papers to these conferences so we do these internal reviews and I'm critical and I tell people look you know you shouldn't feel bad about this I'll try to be giving this to you in a good way but it is the truth <laughs> and so, so all that critical thinking and uh, right uh, looking at picking out the negative things has been helpful on that side of my life. But I do understand in my personal life, it's not always healthy. So I'm trying to develop a much more holistic view. Mm. Uh, that's been a process that's underway now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, do you think there's a point to life, to our existence? Um, I do think that. And for me, it is this... Uh, process of living the world, hopefully in a better shape than what it was, right? Hopefully with better knowledge and enabling humanity to tackle bigger challenges than uh, when we came into this world. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. I know that's uh, always not easy to achieve, but uh, that's what I strive to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, what do you struggle with in life? Um, I think that goes back to the earlier point of like uh, struggling to understand other people, right? Especially people who are maybe not as mathematically oriented or right, uh, rational thinking and more uh, judgmental like I am. Uh, so I think uh, that's something I'm like, why not? This is so obvious, right? Like <laughs> all the facts are here. What is the big deal? So. Yeah. I think over time, I've understood the nuances of how people may arrive at entirely different opinions. And uh, I mean, sometimes it's a personal choice. I think I do believe in freedom of choice and freedom of expression, right? But if they are then trying to impose that on others, then that's a big problem, right? So yeah. there, is, uh, there is that. Uh, and it also depends on how dangerous is the issue? Like, you know, if somebody is saying, now I won't get vaccinated for COVID, <laughs> this is not just affecting them, but everybody else around them, right? So uh, versus uh, uh, like, uh, you know, I don't want to get an abortion, it's their choice. I mean, if that somebody doesn't want to do it for themselves, that's a personal choice, right? So, but I do understand like how people can arrive at very different opinions than, what uh, you know, I have arrived at. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you decide what to work on? Um, for me, it's a lot of it is how new and how difficult is it. Mm. So, I mean, in, to me, like you know, there has to be like research means, right? That there isn't already a full path laid out. And uh, if you're worried about scooping up, somebody getting, you know, having this scooped up, right? Somebody doing it before us, mm -hmm. I don't think that's the right problem to solve. Mm -hmm. So I want to work on challenges that are more long-term, that are extremely difficult, but we can make concrete headway, right? Mm -hmm. And what would be the toy version of that problem? Is that too trivial or is there, again, some good insights? So I like to break down a very complex puzzle into simple pieces and work on it for a longer time. Uh, and also think about, right, like kind of learning and you know, getting inspirations from new areas, especially other areas of sciences and neuroscience that can help bring new ideas. Yes. So, yeah, that kind of constant, like kind of exploration and lifelong learning. <laughs> And uh, solving non-obvious problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, what are some traits that you found to be in common across some of the best collaborators or colleagues you've had? Yeah, I've been so lucky to have amazing uh, collaborators, both at NVIDIA and Caltech, and even in the broader ecosystem. Uh, uh, being a very collaborative person, and that's enabled me to right, go into new areas that wouldn't be possible on my own, for instance, one of the recent papers we recently published in a clinical journal on using computer vision for robotic surgery, right? And understanding the gestures there and, and that leads to the quality of recovery. So there is a lot of like importance to doing that well. Mm -hmm. So understanding those domain specific requirements and uh, right, like how AI can make an impact, that was really cool. Another example is in uh, quantum uh, uh, computations, like how to speed them up uh, from traditional methods and um, uh, be able to still take in domain specific features, right? Rather than just use a standard neural network, give it the raw data. It cannot transfer to larger molecules. It cannot do zero shot generalization. So be able to have the domain knowledge, decide what from the domain we need to pick. And for that, that has to be a very close trusted relationship with collaborator in this case, Tom Miller, who's faculty at Caltech, right? So understanding that is critical uh, for us to make an impact. So my best for collaborations have come about where there are complementary skills like this, because then you're in this process of exploring what the other person has to bring to the table and brainstorming and doing it in a very non-judgmental way, because there is, uh, uh, a lot of uh, you know aspects that I don't know, so I can be extremely dumb, but I can say I don't know this. <laughs> Teach me this. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, people who are also open to that, right? Who can that way take my advice and say like you know just because a model is hyped up in literature doesn't mean <laughs> that's the right thing. So I mean, both who can uh, give that broad perspective of the field, like you know, so they're not only promoting their own methods in the field, but saying, look, this is what the broadly the field looks like and be able to have a door for me to share the same. I think that's, those are always the best collaborations for me. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, when was the last time you felt like a kid in a candy store? Oh, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I can never grow up in that <laughs> Like I'm always just too excited, you know, <laughs> and that's what I miss by not having this in-person interaction because usually I'm the one who's like kind of standing up, using my hands, you know, <laughs> and laughing. So I kind of like to bring that uh, energy and excitement into everything I do. Uh, yeah. And uh, for me, like learning about new problems, that's what makes me feel like a kid in the candy store. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. Would you easily get nostalgic about? I think uh, I get nostalgic about having more of the time to think, you know, and uh, be able to just like kind of go deeper into the beauty of math. I did that, uh, you know, in my at the end of my high school when we had to take the entrance exam for the IITs, you know, where I went to college. Uh, coming from Mysore, which is a smaller city, there was no uh, prep schools or any kind of coaching available. So mm. there was a lot of self-learning, right? And, uh, but that way is great. I mean, then you could not fake it. You couldn't just <laughs> say, okay, somehow I'll engineer this solution because you had to kind of understand every step of the solution to get there. Okay, why is this done? What if I did it in another way? you know, would it break down? So I had to constantly keep questioning every aspect, did I learn this right or not? Mm -hmm. And so that helped me like kind of do a lot of that on my own without a time pressure or without uh, just, I feel like sometimes also bad teaching is hurtful, right? If, uh, the instructor is not giving you that path of learning. Yeah. Then, you know, it's really bad because you can cheat and do well in the exams but you've not really gotten an understanding. Uh, so I, I, many times I feel nostalgic about how I could really take the time to understand and appreciate the beauty of math. And uh, I keep trying to go back to that. I do that in limited <laughs> times now, but I always enjoy that. Yeah, 
Um, what are some of the best advice you've gotten or given? Um, the best advice I've gotten is to, you know, believe more in myself and be confident and uh, not be taken in by external rejections and uh, be more confident to say no to things. Mm -hmm. I think that's something uh, I've only developed more recently and after a lot of <laughs> push from uh, you know, my close family and colleagues. So, uh, so I would say that's something that uh, people who are, especially younger people, feel like, oh, they have to do everything. They have to agree to everything, right? So otherwise they'll be at fault. So questioning, you know, is this adding to your growth? Is this something you enjoy doing, which is really important, right? I mean, maybe not everything you do is enjoyable, but at least most of them should. Yeah. So yeah. I think that aspect is important. Um, yeah. And the advice I give is the same and uh, uh, be, uh, you know, open to asking for help. And we should, and that can only happen if it's a healthy environment where that is appreciated. Yeah. Right? You can't just tell people <laughs> ask for help. And then that goes into the review or that impression that, oh, this person is not capable. Yeah. So yeah. We have to create environments where people feel uh, safe to ask for help and they receive help. Yeah, yeah. Um, why did you decide to do this interview with me? Oh, I uh, really appreciated uh, a lot of what you're doing, Devi, including uh, these series. I think bringing the humanity of uh, <laughs> researchers. I think it's important for the world to see because uh, unfortunately, they're only seeing tropes around AI, right? Whether it's the hyped up uh, stories around them of how GPT-3 can just uh, uh, replace all journalists, <laughs> which is far from true, or even more insidious is the Sophia robot, which is not even really a robot. It's really a faked version of uh, mimicry. It's not even an AI in the sense it's not learning from data. Right, but yeah. that's the representation people have of a feminine version of AI. <laughs> right? Not real people, not flesh and blood, <laughs> but this bot. So my crusade is to help uh, the public receive a different side of AI, and that includes uh, the uh, humans behind AI, especially women and underrepresented minorities. They deserve to be. Uh, represented well, the public deserves to see them. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's everything I had. I know we're out of time, but is there anything else about you, about your life that you feel like we should have talked about that we didn't get to? Yeah, thank you, Devi. This is so fantastic. <laughs> Honestly, I, I didn't uh, know what I was uh, going to be faced with when I got in. I knew there would be some tough questions, but I didn't even <laughs> mentally prepare ahead because I wanted it to be spontaneous and yeah. I thank you for challenging me. I think some of the questions you asked, uh, I don't think anyone has asked me that. <laughs> so that uh, hopefully will help me think better and be emotionally aware and be a better person for everybody around me. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Anuman. Thanks for taking the time. I really enjoyed talking to you. <laughs> Take care. Yeah. Bye.